Hey, 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 Closet Busters, come on and gather around. It's time once again to kick down those closet doors of life. We're here to escape our BS, explore our fears, and elevate our self-expression. I'm your host, Rick Clemens, Bold Move Expert and Coming Out Coach, and I'm going to take you to the party, the pulpit, the wake, and back to the party of living your life uncloseted. So come on, grab hold of yourself and get ready to step out, step up, and step in to living your truth as we explore more stories, tips, and tricks for living your life uncloseted. Now let's get to the show. Hey, 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 closet dwellers and bold move makers. It is time once again for Life Uncloseted. And today we're going to talk about body, body, body. We're going to look at stuff that sometimes we forget. Because the one thing that's universal for all of us human beings is not that we all speak the freaking same language, because we know that's not for sure, but we all speak the same body language. And it's so universal, but sometimes we don't even dial into this stuff. And as I've coached people through the coming out process and helped men come to terms with who they are in their lives and say, hey, I want to make these bold moves. I want to be this kind of guy. Worked with women who say, I'm tired of this crap that I go through. The one thing that I find consistently is every time somebody gets really charged about something, and I don't get to do this very often because I don't see my clients on video a lot of times, but what I notice is the body language is almost always the same. When we're upset and uptight and all this sort of stuff, things happen, shoulders go up, we kind of draw in different things, but I'm not the expert. And the reason today I'm bringing this guy onto the podcast He's because, first of all, he's a friend that I met through National Speakers Association, and he does some amazing, amazing work with body language. He's on TV quite a bit, doing stuff, doing some analysis and things. And I thought, what better way to really start to step in to you being able to make your bold moves to find yourself in those closets and get out is to start to observe other people, their body language, know when to take the cues, but also to start to adapt what is your own body language sending when you're in some of these most chaotic spaces. So that's why I am bringing my friend Leo Cardenas on. He's that body language guy. And I just want to say, hey, bro, thanks for being here today and, and coming and talking to my Life and Closet audience about body language. Well, thank you very much for having me. I look forward to it. Yeah, man. So let's kind of dial back a little bit. You came to this country and um, before, you know, you know, we won't go political here, but before any walls were built, so to speak, but you didn't know how to speak the language, right? You were kind of green to the English language when you came here. So I came from uh, Caracas, Venezuela, which back then was like New York City, mm -hmm. Latin America. It's no longer the case, but it used to be that way. Right. And, uh, I wanted to come to the United States to learn how to speak English. And uh, I always thought my parents would send me to a place like Chicago or New York or, you know, Miami, which... I would have never learned English in Miami, but right. uh, I ended up in Wichita, Kansas. <laughs> wow. So nobody spoke Spanish whatsoever there. So I was forced into, into the body language world by accident because I really had to figure out what I was saying with my body and what people were saying to me with their body. And I kind of developed a sixth sense uh, for uh, body language. Mm-hmm. And how did that start to help you through this starting to learn English? Because I, I get it. I totally get it because I watch people all the time as I'm work, doing my work. But what was the thing that started really helping you in this body language? Because it's like, here you are, foreign country, middle of the U.S., really nobody around you um, that's speaking this language, probably, quite honestly, probably quite a very few um, brown people in that area. So what did you start to notice most by just being able to observe body language? So, you know, there's no better place to learn it than when you're thrown into that situation, right? So English became uh, the third language I learned. Uh, body language became the first one. Uh, I mean, Spanish was my first one, then body language was my second one. But I never really paid attention to my body language at all until I had to try to tell people what I needed, what I wanted, uh, what I was trying to tell them. And I started realizing that the more I expressed myself uh, with my body, with my hands, with my facial expressions, the more they seemed to understand what I was trying to convey. There are certain things, you know, there's, 
People say that 90% of what we say is with body language. Right. Don't ever go by that graph. Don't ever go by those statistics because the guy that even came up with that result says that it is often misquoted on, on the research. They say a lot of things with, with our body language. Now, certain things are universal. Uh, some things are not. Some things are very cultural. Some things are very uh, based on the country, based on the state, right. and the culture that you're in. So I have to watch out for those things. But micro expressions, your facial expressions tend to be uh, universal. Mm-hmm. And I, start, I started reading people's facial expressions. I have a, a – I call myself an empath. I can really mm-hmm. feel people – and I think a lot of it has to do with uh, being able to read their body language naturally. Mm-hmm. I did foray into body language throughout my life, uh, just reading books here and there. But it wasn't until uh, maybe 2006, 2007 that I really started paying attention a lot more because that's when I got thrown into the business of training. Mm. Uh, I was – one of those people that hated public speaking like everybody else and a great opportunity came in. I had already learned English. I learned English the first year that I was in Wichita. So uh, you pick it up really quickly when you're thrown into that situation. Right. right. Um, but I didn't know how to express myself on stage and how to train people and how to uh, convey a message better. So I started reading books. I started watching things and it really, really helped me with my craft. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to figure out, okay, what's the science behind body language? Because there, there has to be something. I don't like that people say, well, I do this and it works better. Well, that doesn't mean that it's based on real science. I wanted to know why people react in a certain, certain way. And it's all in the brain. Mm-hmm. Uh, I started taking courses and I started doing certifications on body language and micro expressions and, and, I learned so much, and after that, I'm like, okay, what do I do with this? Right. When I, 2015 is when I joined NSA, I'm like, I want to share this message. I want people not necessarily, I don't want to teach them how to read other people right away. Mm -hmm. My message was more about being mindful of your own body language. Mm -hmm. We pay attention to it. I mean, once we grow out of the baby stages, we forgot forget to pay attention to our hands, to our face, to our feet, to our, you know, our belly button. <laughs> right. Exactly. Things that we have to do. And when you are paying attention to those things, then you are conveying a much better message and you want people to trust you, to feel you. And the way to do that is to really know what am I doing with my hands? What am I doing with my face? Am I smiling? Mm-hmm. Am I, do I have RBF? Uh, are my feet pointing in the right direction? So it's definitely important to to mind your own body language. Mm-hmm. You know, it's interesting that you bring this up, uh, Leo, because one of the things that I have been told throughout life, and, and especially before I came out of the closet, <clears throat> was I always kind of came across as this very just stoic, kind of serious guy. And part of it was I knew prior to coming out that I was carrying such a heavy load, carrying so many secrets. And then as I started to go through the process, I realized that was my defense mechanism. If I was you know, kind of hunched over, serious face, nobody would approach. And if nobody approached, then nobody could get in and nobody would figure things out. But then as I started to open up and become more myself, and I still have some hunched shoulder stuff that I'm working on, but what I started to realize is the more I opened up, the more people I drew into me, the more I was able to share myself, to be happier. All these things started to affect me. And this is one of the core reasons I wanted to have you on the podcast is I don't think we are mindful enough in ourselves, let alone observant enough in other people to realize how much our body language can invite people in or push people away. And it can be the smallest little thing. Uh, I was in Portland just this past week and I was at a, a restaurant, sat at the bar because I was traveling on my own. I was like, cool, let's just sit at the bar and eat. And I was watching the people next to me and they were like kind of struggling with, you know, getting the bartender's attention and everything. And I knew we were going to have this conversation at some point in the near future. And I started observing them and they were like very, their body language was very like almost aggressive. Like, can you just get me my drink? 
And here I am sitting back, like totally chill, totally relaxed. And the bartender was like totally paying attention to me. Now I know it was probably my dashing good looks, of course, you know. <laughs> of course, of course. But it was so interesting. And I kept watching this like constantly. And he then he's like, hey, would you like this? Would you like to try this? And the next thing I know, he's like giving me some free samples of sake and stuff. And I thought, wow, this is so interesting. And finally, the couple next to me, I saw her kind of lean back and chill a little bit. And I don't know whether it was because of the body language. I'm kind of assuming it might have been part of it. Suddenly, the bartender was like, so what would you like? And he suddenly engaged. But the guy was all hunched up, still in that space. So I think this is why, at least for me, as I'm starting to observe this and stuff that I see, it helps us begin to communicate and see what's going on for other people. And I think that's what you're pointing towards, is the more we get it for ourselves, the better we can be in any situation. Well, and we're all designed to read body language. I mean, mm -hmm. we're designed to detect it. We have to know. There's very few people, people on the autism spectrum, they tend to uh, not have such a good grasp at, at reading people, so they need help with that. But most other people are designed to, to, to recognize body language. Men, women do it better than men, mm -hmm. and which is not surprising. And if right. it, that wasn't true, I would still say that that's the way it is. But... It, it is designed, it is part of our DNA to, to recognize we're tribe people. Mm -hmm. So we want to know what's happening within our tribe at all times. And the best way to do that is to read people's body language. And when we send a message of congruency, when our body language is open, is honest, is, is happy, then mm -hmm. we tend to attract other people. And right. We don't attract people when we are in a bad mood is because people don't want to be around that. Mm -hmm. And I can't even imagine what it has to be to live in the closet. And you are actually, I believe people that are still in the closet are even more mindful of their body mm -hmm. simply because they know they're telling two stories mm -hmm. to be projecting a certain image as to not give themselves away. So I do think they are very, very mindful. I don't think specifically they know it's their body language that they're being mindful of. Right. But they're putting up a face and something that is not them mm -hmm. in to protect themselves. So you're, yep. Maybe you were more closed off. Uh, maybe you uh, wanted people not to approach you, so you didn't have to deal or give yourself away. Yep. Some people are completely different. Some people are just this one image in front of their family, in front of their friends. But when they go out or when they have an opportunity to be themselves, it changes the way they are. Mm -hmm. they're, now they're congruent. Their body is doing exactly what it's supposed to be doing. So it's it, it has to be tough. And But they, they are very, very mindful of their body like, simply because they're trying to keep an image, uh, mm -hmm. an image, a certain image to people so that they don't give themselves away. But I think this happens with everybody. I mean, I, I'm starting to do some work in the business world. And actually, you know, I just did a, a workshop at the, at the college university space. And then I got to, I got to see a fellow NSA um, colleague of ours, Mike Domish, do his talk um, in the last week in front of students. And again, I guess I was predisposed to knowing that you and I are going to have this conversation, but I started watching in the student crowds really the body language, especially in Mike's thing. When I was leading my own, I was kind of observing it, but I'm trying to, you know, do my thing and also trying to like focus on, okay, what kind of feedback are the guys giving me body language and verbal. But in Mike's program, it was so interesting. So for those of you who don't know Mike, he does this talk around date safe um, on campuses where everything's about consent, permission-based dating and touching and kissing and, you know, sex and everything. And it was so interesting to see the athletes in the crowd. There was a few of them. It wasn't for the athletes. The next one he did was for athletes. But it was like there was this group of three guys, and their body language was like, yeah, I, I don't need this. <laughs> I've got this covered. I'm totally, you know, why am I? You could just, it just reeked. I mean, and I was sitting about six, six eight seats away from them. And I was laughing to myself going, this is so interesting to watch. Then, opposite of that, were the people who were kind of like sitting in the crowd that you could tell the conversation was making them very uncomfortable. You know, they were kind of like tight and they weren't open. And, and it was almost like you could see their hands like just 
fumbling around and you know trying to get comfortable. So this stuff is so powerful. And I know for you, as you go do this, a lot of what you're trying to teach people is that mindfulness piece. So you can see it in yourself, but also how to observe it in others. So when you find someone who's really struggling to connect with people, what is something you would say would help them from really starting to understand body language? Well, the first thing is I want them to pay attention to themselves. I want them to practice paying attention to one aspect of their body language. Mm -hmm. Uh, And you will do that same thing when you want to read uh, other people's body language. And I'll show you in a little bit how, but the first part is for me was, okay, what am I doing with my hands? Mm -hmm. Forget my face, forget my head, forget my feet. I need to focus on one thing, one thing only for a full day. Mm -hmm. And I focus on my hands. And what happens is once you do that, you start seeing it in other people as well. Mm -hmm. So whenever, do you you ever play that that license plate game? Mm -hmm. Yep. You know, if I told you, look only for Alaska license plates, then your brain gets patternized and gets primed to only search for that one word or that one design. Same with if I tell you to look for bugs, you know, a, a VW bug, you start seeing it. All of a sudden, you were not paying attention to it, but now because I primed you to it, right. you, you, your brain starts looking for it. And the reason it does that is because the brain hates to spend energy that it doesn't have to spend. Mm-hmm. If if I tell you to look for something in particular, then your brain finds a way to make it easier to make it efficient. And what it does, it creates a pattern of recognition. So it makes it a lot easier for you to spot certain things. So if I tell you, for example, I did this with my son. Uh, we were at, a, at an amusement park. And I said, okay, I, I want you to look for people in the crowd that have their hands in their pockets. That's it. Mm-hmm. Anything else, spot people with their hands in the pocket. And all of a sudden, he starts seeing all those people. He's like, there's one, there's one, there's one, there's one. But if I hadn't told him that, and I had said, just spot body language and people and tell me what you see, your brain just goes crazy. There's too much to watch. There's nothing to really focus on. But because we did that, now his brain, and the more you do it, the better, his brain starts making it easier. It creates new pathways that makes it easier for you to recognize people with their hands in their pocket. Maybe he doesn't know what it means yet. Mm -hmm. Maybe I didn't tell him. But that's the first step is recognizing what you're doing or what other people are doing. Forget about what it means right now. Right. Just focus. Spot it. And then you start training your brain to look for people with their arms crossed. People are hunched over what I call the the, the turtling, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know. Uh, People, people's feet. So I give you one task a day. Look for this one thing and you'll start seeing that all of a sudden you start paying attention to it. Mm -hmm. Because the brain finds or you're telling your brain that this is something important and I want you to pay attention to it. So figure out a way to make it easier for me. Right. All of a sudden you're able to find it. Mm -hmm. Well, it's because the focus is being put on the thing that you most need to learn. And I think if, if you came on here and said, okay, here's what I want you to do. I want you to look at people with their hands in their pocket. and It means X, Y, Z. People aren't going to comprehend that right out the gate. I mean, they might, but it's not going to be easy to like, put into their system. But the more you're like, okay, we're going to look for hands in the pocket, hands in the pocket. So that we get used to it. Feet pointed out, feet pointed in shoulders, hunched, so shoulders straight up. It's the start learning to recognize, then we'll take the next step and start doing the interpretation because there's, I know from looking at your new cards, which we'll get to momentarily, there's lots of different interpretations based on body language. So as people start to observe this stuff, then where do you take them? Well, and, one thing that I always tell them is you always have to put things into context as well. So that's why mm-hmm. I interpret so much right away. I just want you to learn to observe, basically, is what we're doing first. Yep. Which a lot of it has to be put into context. I can't assume that somebody has their arms crossed because they're not enjoying my presentation. It could be cold. They're more comfortable. They feel, you know, they're more introvert, introverted. And when they're in a situation like that, they feel more comfortable if they hug themselves. Right. So at that point, forget about what it means. Just learn to observe. Then once you start observing, once you learn to observe, then we're going to look for clusters. And clusters is 
a way to figure out, okay, one gesture alone doesn't mean something necessarily. And I think in the during the Clinton indictment uh, things, people were saying, well, he's scratching his nose, so that means he's lying. Well, first of all, it turned out that he was lying, but that alone did not mean that. Mm-hmm. It, the other gestures that told people that he might be lying. So, for example, he would uh, scratch his nose. He would point away when he talked about a certain person. So you look for clusters and you realize, okay, now – and this is not 100% either, but now I'm more certain that that person might be lying or they're uncomfortable or they're right. comfortable, they're happy, they're angry. You can't just assume because of one thing, mm-hmm. uh, you know how to read people. And I think that's what we do with our brains automatically is we see the forest for the trees. Yep. So something tells us there's something not right about a person. When you learn body language, you start seeing the trees, mm-hmm. and realizing I can't see that person's hands, for example. That's why my I can't trust them. Uh, they don't look at me in the eyes. Again, if you put things into context, not yeah. every culture, it makes really good eye contact. So you have to be careful. Are they from a different culture as well? So you, you can see a lot of people interpreting body language differently, and that's why I try to stay within the science, mm-hmm. but also apply the cultural aspect of body language. I mean, yeah. For example, this that we do here a lot. Mm-hmm. You do this in Greece. You don't want to do this in Brazil. So you got to be careful mm-hmm. with kind of things as well. Yeah, and I I know even as I've done work with different people from all different cultures, even as you start to learn, okay, what's culturally acceptable. It's all something that can make the person feel uncomfortable and it can make you, the person who's interacting, feel uncomfortable because you don't know this stuff. But when you start to step into it, and I guess this is where you get to that place of being really curious and you go, okay, what are the other possibilities? If you see, as you said, one gesture, that doesn't necessarily mean anything. Just like if somebody tells me, you know, going back to coming out work a little bit, which it's interesting to watch the responses when I ask this question. And especially when I can see the person, you know, live, when I ask the question, how do you know you're gay or how do you know you're lesbian or bi or whatever it might be? The body answers that question well before they say the word, because if they get a little defensive, I know they're not comfortable. You know, if their body starts to close off, I know they're, they're not comfortable. I know there's a piece of shame there. If they do something like really flippant, I know there's a sign that maybe they are slightly accepting of who they are, but they may not be totally comfortable in it. If they like stand real tall and suddenly launch into it, I could take that one gesture of, okay, you're, you're scaring me. So I'm going to come back. Even if I say, I know because of this, why would you question that? It's that body language that sets the tone. I can almost always predict what the answer is going to be by suddenly, what does their body do the moment I ask that question? And I find it really fascinating to watch that unravel in front of my eyes. Well, and I think it, we always try to project what we do into other people as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. One of my theories, and I don't know if I'm right about this or not, but a, is that the famously known gaydar yep. uh, that, that uh, gay people have is because you recognize certain patterns of their body language that you uh-huh. use yourself as well. Yeah. And that's why it makes it easier for you to maybe recognize another person uh, that might be, you know, gay, bi, whatever, because you see it, uh, you have seen it in yourself and you recognize mm-hmm. other people that are not um, gay don't see it simply because that's not what, uh, mm-hmm. what we went through, for example. It, right. We were in the closet. So I think, we, you know, certain people are, uh, are really good at body language of a uh, very specific topic simply because mm-hmm. they have experienced it themselves. Sure. And, and I can almost recognize, you know, the, in the personality uh, spectrum of uh, Myers-Briggs, for example, ENFPs, which is like 80% of the speakers. Yeah. But you see the same things that you do. You see the same extroversion, the same empathy, the same feelings. So it's almost easy to recognize all the people that have similar personality. And again, mm-hmm. 
goes back down to tribal people. Yep. We were designed to recognize either trouble, fear, happiness, happiness, anger in our uh, uh, our community in our village because we didn't have texting. We had to recognize from far away what was happening. Is it safe to approach? Uh, do I see fear in their eyes? If I see fear in their eyes, I know that I'm not going to go in that direction or I'm going to try to go help that person. So we were designed to to recognize these things. And, and we are all humans. We are all connected in one way or another. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I find it interesting, especially, you know, most people know I'm a pretty big guy. I'm, you know, almost 6'4", and <clears throat> big, heavy, stocky guy. And it's always interesting for me to go to another country because just by pure stature, it can be very intimidating. Yeah. And so if I, <clears throat> and I've tried this a couple of times, I was in Tokyo a couple of years ago. And of course there, it's like, I'm giant man, you know? Uh, and uh, it's like, wow, really interesting. But if I smiled, they didn't quite know what to do either. If I just kind of stayed very stoic and, and matched their, their cultural personality, which is, they don't, there's not a lot of talking on the streets and stuff. You just kind of go do your thing. It was almost like, believe it or not, I felt like I blended in. But if I smiled and I was like being real open, I don't know that they knew what to do. Now, once we got, and here's what's interesting. Once we got inside a building or we were in you know, a classroom or in a shopping center or something, then it changes because everybody talks once they're in buildings and stuff. Then I was much more accepted. But it was when I was out on the street, A, the intimidation of the size was one thing that fact that I'm American and, you know, we kind of, well, I shouldn't say we all, that's a generalization, but we kind of are much more open about talking on the streets and saying hello and all this sort of stuff. It was definitely that intimidation factor that started to show up. And I found it really amazing when I just kind of played by the role, just walked the street, didn't really look at anybody. I didn't near get as many looks as I did when I was up and looking around. So interesting well, stuff. You were being incongruent, right? So again, right. I, I, <clears throat> Um, not just me, but humans tend to trust other people that look more like us, that act mm-hmm. like us. I mean, we, we, if we had to ask two people in the street for directions, and you're one of those people, or the other person is, an, is another Japanese person that looks just like me, I'm likely to ask them for directions than ask you. First of all, you're tall, right. which, which primarily I should be afraid of, right? Because mm-hmm. you mm-hmm. Can, you can do a lot of harm to me, so my brain is not going to go. Well, don't don't risk it with this person, right? Somebody that you trust immediately because they look like you doesn't mean that they're going to be better. But that's what the brain does. The brain's sole function is to keep you safe. Exactly. It'll do whatever it has to do. So we are judgmental as heck simply because mm-hmm. the brain is trying to keep us safe. So when given those two options, that's what we're going to do. And I, unfortunately, that's a lot of a. Uh, stereotyping and our our own experiences, what we grew up with, what our yep. parents used to tell us. I mean, we all have parents or grandparents that have a whole different view on race and different things. So we unfortunately uh, inherit some mm-hmm. of those at a primal level. Yeah. So the brain knows, okay, you want to look, like you said, you know, brown. I'm yep. going to for somebody that looks like me and, and, and I feel like I could relate more to that person. Now, I'm very aware of that and I try to bypass what my brain is doing with the rational part of my brain. Mm-hmm. I'll try to do that. But given the situation, yeah, you are you were outside of the norm. You were smiling in a place where nobody smiles. So it's, sort right. of, it's not a pattern. So you're breaking the pattern. So the brain is going, what? I can't do this. This, this guy doesn't match here. So. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. So let's get to these cards that you've just come out with. They're great. Um, In fact, we're going to give away a set of them. For anybody who listens, just shoot me an email to rick at rickclemens.com. We've got a set of Leo's body language cards, which is actually kind of like a game. It can be used in a personal setting. It can be used with family, friends. It can be used in a work environment. You can use it yourself. In fact, the reason we even started having this conversation with one of my clients is struggling really hard with like being out and open and, and being confident and stuff. And I said, okay, well, you're, you're expecting a lot from other people. I said, so maybe you need to quit assuming things about what people are thinking based purely on their body language. And then right after that, you launch these cards and everything. So let's talk a little bit about the cards and what you're offering with your new body language cards. 
So the cards are called clues and cues. And the reason I designed them is, like, like I said earlier, if we try to focus too much on everything that's happening in the body, the brain goes crazy. And I wanted to give people a task. I wanted people to pull out one of these cards at random, whether you're at the airport or you're at a coffee house or at a, at a party, just pull one out. So if I were to pull this one, for example, the pickpocket. So I could try to give him easy, funny names so they can remember. Uh, forget about what he says underneath right away. What I'm trying to prime your brain yep, is yep. find a person with their hands in their pockets. Yep. And that's all I'm going to look at at the airport, for example. I'm going to be sitting, waiting for my flight, and I'm going to be looking at people. First of all, you're not looking at your phone anymore. So you're, you, you're doing something that you're breaking something that you normally uh, do. Now I'm doing something better. So it's more funny. It, it engages people more. I'm making eye contact with people because I'm looking at them. Sometimes, you know, it can be creepy, but I'm actually just paying attention to what they're doing with their body. So once I prime my brain to do that, and I, I, I categorize them. So they're all five categories. This is the hands, for example. So that mm-hmm. is a specific body part that I'm looking at. Right. They, the next day or an hour later, if I if I already spotted a bunch of people, then I'm going to look for the next one. This one is the curler, for example. This is a girl that's playing with her hair, wrapping it around her finger. You will yeah. see that a lot in, in, in dating, for example. People that are uh, uh, going out on a date, if she does that, it's a good thing for guys, right? So she could be flirtatious, she could be playful, but she could also be bored. So you have to put things into context. Again, this Part is the second part of this this game, basically. The first part is training your brain to observe these things. Then I might look for the feet, for example. This is legs and feet, and I just dropped it. <laughs> legs and feet. And this mm-hmm. girl that is kicking her foot, for example. So if you're sitting, if you're somewhere where you can see people's feet, I don't want you to look under the table. Right. <laughs> uh, when you're having dinner, but if you can see her feet and you see her kicking her feet up, then you train your brain to look for that. And then you can say, okay, what does that mean? Well, it means that she could be anxious, she could be nervous, she could be impatient as well. So those are all the things. And then you can get into the more advanced stuff, which is the face, mm-hmm. the micro expressions and certain things that we flash really quickly. Yeah. So this one is the eye roller, for example, and it tells me that this person's frustrated, is annoyed, but just train your brain to look for these patterns. Just do it for a full hour, for a full day. Don't don't mm-hmm. spot every single thing in the deck right, in, right. because you're going to go crazy. You have to train your brain to observe first. And I love this because it's a great primer for starting to step in and be not only aware of other people's body language, but to also be aware of your own. I know for me, I'm a big verbose, hands go everywhere, and a lot of people are like, oh, that makes you a typical gay male. I'm like, no. <laughs> the reason my hands go everywhere is I'm very expressive. If that's the case. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I was going to say, well, Leo could be considered very gay, but I know he's not, but, but he's a very, very expressive person, you know, which is so interesting to watch because I remember as I was starting to, you know, do the training in my speaking, one of the toughest things for speakers, new speakers, and even some of us that have been doing this for a while, is we have the hardest time knowing what to do with our hands on stage. But the beauty is stand on stage with doing nothing with your hands. That's how you break this. Then it becomes natural to know I can put my hands down by my side, stand there and deliver a line. My hands don't have to be anywhere. And then when I do the expression, it's actually much better when I do something that's big and bold. And it's so interesting to watch all this stuff. That's, um, that's why I got kicked out of Toastmasters. I didn't <laughs> use my hands for everything. They kept telling me, only use them when they're purposeful. When it's purposeful, yes, exactly. I, I, I use my hands for everything. So that's, you see a lot of speakers, they do a handheld microphone mm-hmm. because that gives them something to do with their hands. I, I prefer the, the lavalier simply yeah, yeah. because be bringing people on stage on how to do the perfect handshake, how to do networking and all those. So I can't right. can have somebody hold the microphone. Right. For me. Yeah. And it, and it does definitely impact you. And I think some people don't realize this. I had a, I, I think we'll kind of bring this back around full circle here. I just had a client who just came out of the closet um, to his wife already knew, but he's to his kids, to his parents, 
to some friends. And um, he said, I have this thing I want to read to them. And I said, okay, that works for him. But I thought to myself, if I was doing that, that wouldn't work for me. Because if I'm holding something that I can't, I'm not going to be my natural self. I have to be my natural self. And I always find it interesting when I go to speak and they have, yeah, even though I've said I need a lavalier mic, whatever. And then you show up and there's the handheld mic. It's like, okay, I got to completely readjust how I'm going to present now because I can't do some of the stuff I want to do because I now have to hold this microphone. So, um, well, this has been amazing guy. And I love it that you have these cards. Again, we're going to give away a set of Leo's cards. There's also going to be a link to where you can get your own set um, of cards from Leo. And I'd highly encourage anyone to really look at these and start to think about how can your life be different when you really understand body language. Not that by just using the cards, you're going to become a complete expert, but I would invite you to do it. If you have some more stuff you'd like to learn from Leo, we have a link to his website as well. But um, I want to ask one last question, Leo. Leo. Um, what is the thing that you feel like you've learned most about yourself by doing this work? I know there's got to be something in there. I've learned that the less I restrict myself to be who I am, the better I connect with people. Mm. I, I often think that we are, we try to project a certain image. Mm -hmm. We don't want to look too goofy. We don't want to look too serious. We don't want to look too gay. I mean, it doesn't matter what it is. I think the less I restrict myself and just be who I am, the more I connect with people. I, I, you want to project authenticity. And I think the best way to do that, just be who you are and your body will follow. Your brain doesn't like to have two stories going simultaneously in the brain. And it's easier. It's more fun to just be who you are. And if you're a person that uses their hands, use your hands. If you smile a lot, smile. Now there Thinks that if you know that you're projecting a serious face all the time and people are not right. you, then you might want to work on that. But mm -hmm. it's all about what image you want. There's no right or wrong in body language. It's mm -hmm. what image you want to project to other people. And what I find so interesting about what you just said is for each of us, this is different. <laughs> because when you restrict yourself from being yourself, I don't care if you're a wallflower and you want to – you know, you want to restrict yourself from being that, then make sure you're doing it in the way that's going to work for you. If you want to be less boisterous and handsy or whatever, make sure you understand why you want to do that. There's nothing wrong with those things, but make sure you're not restricting yourself because this is part of who you are. It's part of who you've always been. And I'm always so fascinated when somebody criticizes someone else for like, well, you know, they're so flamboyant. Well, that's who they are. <laughs> They're so loud. Okay, I can get the loud one, yes. But it's understand why you want to change some behavior in yourself. Yeah. What is it you're really wanting to get without completely restricting who you are? Anytime I do a podcast, and we've actually, it was so interesting. I was just having this conversation with someone this morning. They're like, well, you know, I plan mine out. I'm like, good for you. I don't. I get on, I go, I kind of know where the person's coming from. I know how I want to link it into Life Uncloseted. It's like a, a natural organic thing. But if I try to script this, oh my God, I am not being myself. And my hands would actually probably end up in my pocket because I'm like so tight because this is too scripted. And I hope this is what people will take away from this. Your body language is yours, just like your voice, just like everything else. Use it to the space that you become better at connecting and communicating and only change what's necessary to get you where you want to go. And I think that's kind of where you took us today, Leo. So I really appreciate that, man. And totally My pleasure. It's been fun. Yeah, you too, man. So, and with that, I think we're going to wrap it up for this week. Thanks again, Leo, for being here. And um, we will catch everybody in just another week. All right, there you have it. Another episode of Life Uncloseted has come to an end, but that's okay. We're going to be back in just a couple of days sharing more stories, tips, tricks, and wisdom for helping you live your life uncloseted. And you know what? You can share it too. Just take a few moments if you like and if you believe in this podcast and share it with someone you know today. Share it from your phone. Go share it on iTunes, Stitcher, wherever you are. Maybe even give us a rating review because you know what? It's all about the planet living their life uncloseted. I'm Rick Clemens, host of the show and the guy who helps you make those big, bold moves. 
and I hope you never stop stepping out, stepping up, and stepping in to living your life uncloseted. Catch you real soon. Take care, everyone.